Whoa, what the hell? We're recording now. <laughs> I, I don't care for that at all. <laughs> that extremely brief and subtle beep. Yeah, that's right. Oh, wow. Then you're really not going <laughs> to like this. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's my suggestion, that you get out of the way at the top what you need to say about stocks. <laughs> I'm just very excited about game stonk, that's all. But this is going to be such old news by the time the podcast comes out. Who knows what will have happened? Well, I know what will have happened. Somehow, the poor will have gotten screwed on this, even though... By all accounts, it looks like the regular folks are winning at the moment. I bet by the time this airs, somehow the hedge funds will have crushed the joy and financial well-being of the regulars everywhere. What's interesting is financial institutions could help one another out. They could decide that it's in their shared interest to crush the hopes of the poor. Yeah. But there are financial, there are equally large and the larger financial interests at stake that would benefit from GameStop stock going to the moon, as they say. <laughs> Do they say to the moon? They say it a lot. And they also say rocket ship emoji, rocket ship emoji, rocket ship emoji. <laughs> <laughs> it's city business. It's city business. We don't own any stocks, dear listener, as most people don't. That's correct. (laughs) All right. Do you want to talk about our cat's urinary issues instead? I did put that on the (laughs) (laughs) L. It's mostly because I think she's going to make some noise as she periodically gets up to urinate on the floor. (laughs) Yeah, that seems probable. Our poor cat is ill. Yeah, so she has feline idiopathic cystitis, which means we don't know. No but good she's reason. Being a bunch. <laughs> yeah, unknown reason for bladder irritation in yeah. a cat. She's going to the vet. Poor kitty. You're Roman. You're Allison, and this, as far as I can tell, is seedy business. Well, we're here on a Saturday afternoon. I'm feeling great because I have had to be out of work for several days because uh, someone in our office, I should name them, violating all, no, I shouldn't. Yeah, don't do that. (laughs) Came into the office when their spouse had COVID and then they also obviously had COVID. But if my spouse only has symptoms and I don't have (laughs) symptoms yet, then I can go anywhere and do anything. Yeah, of course he develops symptoms (laughs) immediately afterwards. Uh, Yeah, so I got my my negative COVID test result today and I've been out of work for a few days. So my body feels great, like all bodies feel good when they don't have to go to a eight to five job every day. Uh, and it's a it's beautiful Saturday afternoon. It's a warm, as I understand it, the rest of the country is uh, very cold right now. But we are heading back to the 70s again. It is a beautiful time to be alive in sunny, disease-ridden Florida. I believe our county currently is flagged as extremely high risk. <laughs> yeah. In the COVID tracker I checked most recently. Yeah, I mean, I perceive it as such. <laughs> Allison, I believe you were outside for a bit yesterday. Will you tell me what is in our garden? Then let us cultivate our garden. It's the only way to make life endurable. What's in the garden? We're now using a new system where, as we play the musical cues, we are hearing them, which usually we, had, to this point, inserted them after the fact. So aren't you relaxed by the What's in the Garden jingle? Well, I'm more dismayed that you would out me as not having left the house yet today. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Saturday. Come on. You did five hours of writing group work this morning. You've That's been more true. productive than just about anybody. Tell me about our garden. 
Well, uh, yesterday when I was out there, I just was doing a little bit of light weeding and removing old plants from the last season, remnants of old plants that hadn't yet been composted. But I can say the arugula is coming back. Arugula is doing well. Basil's coming back. We still lack soil <laughs> in general. So I, I actually haven't planted any new seeds yet this year which arguably I should. I mean, it's late January, so... We have pretty much every catalog for you to choose from at this point in terms of getting some seeds. I don't even know if I'm going to buy any seeds this year. Hmm. I might just plant remnant seeds that I have either saved or left over from previous years and see what happens. Yeah. Gotta say, I'm chomping at the bit for the arugula to come in so we can stop buying plastic containers of greens from Target. Yeah, I mean, that is one thing that I thought, you know, early in the pandemic was like, well, the more produce we can grow at home, the less tempted we'll be to go out to the grocery store. And I think that's still true, truer than ever, really, because now we're completely unwilling to go into any grocery store for any reason. That's right. And Target is the option for putting things directly into the trunk without going inside anywhere. So that's what we're doing. You have some huge regrets about not taking that pile of dirt that was on the side of the road recently. Someone in our neighborhood was getting rid of... They had a sign in it that said topsoil. I think it was more fill dirt. They were doing some landscaping in their yard. And my fear was like, well, maybe it's not clean. What could it be tainted with? I mean, around here? I don't know, motor oil? <laughs> Whatever people have ever thought was fine to throw out in their yard. Also, if someone has a pile of dirt on their lawn, they may expect to put that dirt back in a hole, right? No, we'd had a sign that said, take it. Did it? Yeah, it oh, had a sign that no. said, free. That's why I've regretted it, because I could have walked over there with the wheelbarrow, taken a few shovelfuls and, you know, gone back and forth a few times and filled up the garden beds. But I just, I had an anxiety that... We were going to ingest some horrible shit? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I probably should have done it, but I didn't. And it's too late. It's gone. <laughs> so I don't know why I'm living in the past. Well, let's put that regret to the side and revisit it periodically over the next several months. Don't forget about lead. Oh, yeah. Right? I mean, I would have at least needed to send it off for testing to see what it was contaminated <laughs> with, by which point then I would have had a bunch of dirt that was now my problem to deal mm. with. Could you test that in your lab? No. That'd be the work of the Soil and Water Commission. Wait, who won that Soil and Water Commission race? Let me look that up. St. John's County Soil and I Water I mean, Commission. nobody good, I think, can win any election in our entire county. <laughs> we did a whole profile on that and then didn't. Yeah, weird that when it comes to political news, I have not been thinking about the county soil and water commissioner lately for some reason. Well, maybe the loser of the soil and water commissioner race attempted to Overthrow mount an insurrection <laughs> against the. It's <laughs> possible as far as I know. Well, it's all on the table now. Anything can happen now forever. That's the standard we've set. Oh, damn. Fuck. Chuck Owen won, as you might expect, beating Brenda Stratton. But it was, it looks to be the closest race in our region. Like, usually the Republican running in this area will win by sort of a two to one. It'll be 66 to 34 percentage wise. But this race was 53% to 47%. Oh, wow. The experienceless Brenda Stratton almost did it. What a shame. Well, if she runs again, we should. Do people knock on doors for Soil and Water Commissioner? <laughs> we should start. All right. Well, let's move on to the, today's catalog, which is, I think, an exciting choice and sort of a, a novel one in that this company is not maybe even a company as much as it is a nonprofit, I believe. Yeah. And they are not primarily a company that sells seeds. It is a large part of their mission, but they have a sort of a wide variety of interests. This is the Native Seeds Search 2021 catalog. I'm sort of amazed that they have a physical catalog that we were able to get. But, you know, if they're part of their mission is to be accessible, not yeah. everyone has the Internet. Yeah, that's true. Or is comfortable using it. Mm-hmm. 
And it's a it's a nice catalog. They stylize the name of their organization as Native Seeds slash search in all caps. You'll see that in the episode description, of course, but just to get that out of the way. What do you think about this catalog? I really like it. Yeah, me too. I'm looking at the PDF. You're looking at the physical copy right now. I think the cover art is really pleasing, first of all. For sure. The physical um, catalog, it's all in color. I think the weight of the pages are nice. Yes, it's a nice paper. The layout is nice. Like the columns are the same width. They're organized in a sensible manner. They have full color images of many of the plants or beans or whatever. Yeah. I think that their font choices are classically those. And I've done some like Googling about this for my own purposes, actually, when I've wanted to print text for sheet music or whatever. But stuff that both looks good printed and looks good on a computer screen. They've used the sort of fonts that I think are are meant to work well in both mediums, which is not always true about these catalogs. Yeah, I would say this is overall very competently executed. Yeah. And again, the, like surprising production value, I think, for a nonprofit with this particular mission and of this particular size. I guess we should talk about what their mission is. Well, let's read their mission statement. Yeah, go for it. Native Seeds Search seeks to find, protect, and preserve the seeds of the people of the greater Southwest so that these arid adapted crops may benefit all peoples and nourish a changing world. My only point with that is, given the coming climate catastrophe, stewardship of seeds that will be arid adapted is a really important mission right now. Yeah, for sure. So I love that they're doing this. You know, they, there's some overlap between what they do and True Love Seeds that we talked about in that they partner with farms in the area. They give out grants to community organizations that work to promote food security, nutrition, community resilience is the term that they use. And in particular, their work centers around crops, seeds uh, important to the indigenous communities of that area. So their vision statement says, We envision the greater Southwest as a place where farms and gardens, kitchens and tables, stores and restaurants are brimming with the full diversity of arid lens adapted heirloom crops. People are keeping the unique seeds and agricultural heritage alive, and the crops, in turn, are nourishing humankind. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce the name of the, the board chair who writes the... Jacob Butler? Well, there's an... <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's, that's one part of an extremely sure. long, difficult to pronounce name. Uh, but he's a... Descent- it might be easy to pronounce. You just don't know right, what the of course. diacritic I'm, marks I'm mean. incompetent to pronounce it. But he is of the Maricopa Indian community. And he writes about a... Apparently, 2021 is a big year of change for them because in consultation with native seed keepers and indigenous people about which varieties are appropriate for distribution and which varieties should be reserved for spiritual or cultural use, they've decided to restrict a portion of their catalog to indigenous people. So the the front half of their catalog are seed varieties available for anyone to purchase. And the back half of their catalog are seeds that they term native access. Incidentally, have you gone to their website at all? I have. Yeah. They're, <laughs> as so many of the seed companies right now, you know, it's something that we saw a lot when we were looking at stuff in March and April, but they are panicked with how much business they have. If you go to nativeseeds.org, I hope we don't send, with our extremely popular podcast, 10 more customers their way right now, because it could crash them entirely. But they've put a, a hold on seed sales right now due to, quote, overwhelming demand. But their website, if you go to it, the tabs at the top advertise or give information about the, the programs that they're involved with. Uh, they not only sell Uh, seeds, but they sell a large number of grocery items. Yeah, they sell food items as well as arts and crafts. Mm -hmm. Yep. Their gift shop has jewelry and baskets and pottery and books and canvas prints, skincare even. And then they sell a variety of specialty foods, 
chilies, spices, herbs, beans, all stuff that's sort of in line with their with their mission, you know. Another resource that they have on their website is a database that lets you search through all the seeds in their possession, some of which, many of which even uh, might not be for sale or available to anyone at the moment. But yeah, they've got this database. And if you look at the entry for any particular seed, it has a lot of information. It has cultural affiliation, collection site, year collected. And then it has a detailed description of the climate in the place where it was collected around the time it was collected. Uh Average temperatures and rainfalls and um, sun exposure and wind. I mean, all of that stuff. And then it describes the seeds and the plants in detail and shows some images of them. And when you go to this database, which is called ADAPTS, Access to Crop Diversity for Climate Resilience and Food Security, they have some example searches of what what type of thing you can achieve by doing their database search. Uh-huh. So I just wanted to say what some of the what the example searches are. I want to see all chili varieties that were collected within 100 miles of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Cool. And for which seeds are currently available, right? Like you can you can make yeah. it really fine grained. Mm-hmm. Or I want to see all bean varieties that are available for distribution ranked by a climatic similarity of their collection localities to Tucson, Arizona. I mean, th- this is an incredible search engine. Yeah, really cool. Please show me everything that was collected above 8,000 feet. I'm a Dine Navajo farmer and would like to obtain seeds of traditional Dine squash varieties. Please show me all accessions from tropical latitudes. So you can you can find stuff that's at a site that's similar to where you are. You can find things that are from a location. You can find things that are from a people. Yeah, I think it's a really cool tool. Well, as a comparison point, I just went to Burpee and using their search engine typed, please show me everything that was collected above 8,000 feet. The result is we were unable to find results for please show me everything that was collected above 8,000 feet. And they have a did you mean? Did you mean? Show that was collected collection? <laughs> yes. Tell them yes and see All right, what they All right, let's give see you. what happens. I clicked yes, and they offer one result for the search string. Show that was collected collection, which was their suggested search. And uh, that result is the best of show tomato collection. Good job, Burpee. All right, do you want to read some descriptions here? Sure, let's do it. Again, I mentioned the first half of this catalog is available for anyone to purchase. I thought we could read some of the chilies from that portion, and then we could go to the latter half and read some of the indigenous varieties that are available. I'll start with the Anaheim New Mex Heritage. The result of many years of chili breeding at New Mexico State University. High yield, dependable heat, and that traditional New Mexican chili flavor. This is one of the popular chilies grown in Hatch, New Mexico. Medium heat. California Wonder Bell. An exceptional strain of this treasured heirloom bell pepper from the 1920s. Vigorous 24 to 48 inch plants produce thick walled, blocky, 4 inch green fruits, which turn red if allowed to mature fully. I've got to say, the term thick-walled, as we've seen a million times in the past in descriptions, always sounds so suggestive to me in a way that I can't even put my finger on. I'll read the chilaca. This fresh chili is dark green, thin-walled. Not suggestive at all. Sweet and medium-hot. It is called pasilla when dried, possibly because of its brown raisin color. This chili from Mexico requires a long growing season. Plants can grow over four feet tall with chilies seven inches long. Dried pods are used in moles, arrobados, and other sauces. Habanero. Extremely hot with a fruity, citrus-like flavor. Orange, lantern-shaped fruits on plants that prefer warm, moist growing conditions. Handle with care. Heard of that one. Here's the ordoño. 
a stunning ornamental chili from Batopilas Canyon, Chihuahua. The small, upright fruit mature from purple through yellow, orange, and finally red. Heat and drought tolerant and extremely productive. Good for container gardening. Hot and edible. <laughs> Hot and edible. Well, um, it goes through purple to yellow to orange to red. How yeah, festive. I mean, ornamental, ornamental peppers or like things that people grow as ornamental often will go through that range of colors. So you'll see on the same plant at once. Yeah, it'll look you know, like there are a rainbow. fruits of all those different colors at once, depending on their rate of change. Yeah, very cool. Poblano. Called an ancho when dried, a poblano when fresh. Pick when green for a mild flavor or wait until red for increased medium hot heat level. Plants grow two to three feet tall and benefit from support. Extremely versatile in the kitchen. Boy, you know what I could go for that I haven't eaten in the last year is a chili relleno. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. We haven't had any outside the house cuisine besides the pizza place down the street in the last year. Do you want to move to the native access seeds? Sure. Oh, wait, before we do, in their chili pepper section, they note that the Sonoran chiltepine is currently out of stock due to COVID-related high seed demand and summer drought that caused a poor to non-existent harvest in Sonora. They indicate they will try to make these available again as soon as they can. Are you familiar with chiltepines? No. I was not either, but I looked them up because in their, they sell them as food also. And it's a really appetizing looking, like tiny berry-like pepper that I guess is the U.S.'s only native wild chili and like jalapenos, poblanos, cayennes, like all the other peppers were bred from these initially. From what I've seen, they are like they're much hotter than those, like they might be 50,000 or 100,000 Scoville units compared to, I don't know what a jalapeno is, like 5,000 or something like that. And they're like often sun dried and added to cheese or ice cream, which sounds pretty cool. That sounds cool. exciting. It does sound exciting. Or like pickled with oregano and garlic and used as a condiment. By all accounts, they are very hot, but the heat is extremely brief and they taste good. I think part of what has scared me off of hot peppers in the past is like the heat seems to linger and even increase for a long time after you eat one. But the idea that these are very hot, but just for a moment, and then it dissipates, and they in fact also have a nice taste, seems really appealing to me. Well, I'm fascinated by what the molecular mechanism could be for the... Are they producing different capsaicin? It's binding less strongly to your trip receptors or whatever? I, I guess so, yeah. As I always do when we read, re read about uh, hot peppers, I tried to find someone eating one on YouTube, and I found a channel. It's the Papa Pepper channel, which is <laughs> this white guy with dreads and like a horrible beard who also like periodically breaks into his channel to advertise cryptocurrencies. <laughs> okay, well, this I'm already into this guy. <laughs> But let's listen I to I want to take I want to take this guy's advice. Yeah, he has some has some thoughts I bet on GameStop. GameStop, GameStonk, GameStop stocks, GameStop stock. GameStonk. GameStonk. Here he is eating one of the chiltepines. And see uh <laughs> see how he thinks they taste. <laughs> this can't be that hot. It's like a lemon drop on a stick. Probably no hiccups out of you on this one, right? This is I the, learned a thing or two. The only cure. I learned a thing or two from the chip challenge. You just pretend you're not in pain. And then what happens? And then... <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rogers is dead now. There's no more land of make-believe. <laughs> is that for real or are you playing? No, I'm not playing. So what's the flavor like? Um... It's not lemon. It's not lemon. It's very spicy. Uh, scale of 1 to 10, what's your pleasure level at right now? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, incidentally, what's your pleasure level? At Allison's right not now? looking at this video, but he appears to be holding his maybe like five year old daughter as he's trying not to vomit, and she looks just disgusted by what's <laughs> happening. Well, when you say I'm not looking at it, what you mean is you're not showing it to me. The screen is facing only you and there's nothing I could do to look at it. I I just want to be clear about Yeah, that's that's accepting fair. any blame on not wanting to see this guy retching and hiccuping <laughs> into the face of his small child. <laughs> we'll have a private viewing of it later. Anyway, seems pretty seems pretty spicy. Here's the end of the video. I'm Papa Pepper. And I'd like to remind you, don't post for free. If you'd like to be part of a revolution in social media, an economic power to the people where users can actually blog for cryptocurrency, then I'd recommend that you check out <laughs> steamit.com and join the revolution. Pop out. I'm sorry, Papa out. That's the end of every video he does. He does about hot peppers. Where he says, by the way, you should be getting bitcoins for eating hot peppers yeah, like me. that's right. <laughs> what a guy. What a mensch. How does the video end? Does he... That's the end. But no, that's not the end of this video. That's the end of every video. How does... He resolve the situation where he's retching and hiccuping. Oh, he drinks from a big tub of melted ice cream. Wow. What a hero. <laughs> That's the canonic way to do it. Do you have to admit that you can't take it anymore before you drink the melted ice cream? Yeah, it's seen as, seen as weak. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right. Let's read a few more descriptions from the native access section. Well, I think the first thing to comment on is that in the native access section, the seeds are not organized by plant type. That's right. But are organized by people. So they have an Apache section, a Guarajillo, a Hopi. That's how they're organized. You're right. So I think we can, you know, read whatever looks appealing. I'm sort of tempted, even though the podcast listening audience can't see any of the pictures, to just be driven by the pictures of things that I think look cool and then read sure. their descriptions. Got to read that Apache Dipper right from the outset. Well, that is literally what caused me to make this decision, which yeah. is the first image in the Native Access section is a picture of a really cool modeled gourd yeah. that is very pointed at the narrow end. Yeah, very neat. Do you want to read it? No, go for it. Apache Dipper, originally collected in Peridot, Arizona, on the San Carlos Reservation. The neck handle can be up to 12 inches long and bowls around 5 to 7 inches diameter. Yeah, when you say they're modeled, it's a it's a sort of pattern that it's like a watercolor sp- yeah. like drops of That's... black and brown and and yellow and yeah, it looks like dried sienna. dried watercolor splatters. That's a great way of describing it. Yeah, they're really beautiful. I wonder what these are used for. I mean, I guess maybe food, but it seems like they look like they'd be a tool as of a some tool. Sort. I mean, I think they're probably a dipper. <laughs> what to dip into what? <laughs> like a like a water dipper. Oh, okay. I mean, maybe they get made into lots of things, but I'm just saying that's what they're named. So I would assume that that's a, at least one of their <laughs> uses. <laughs> All right, fair enough. So is it is a dipper? Why don't we just look this up right now? Is a dipper gourd <laughs> just a description of the shape, and they're t- they can be used for anything, or they're typically used to make rattles? Let's see. Dipper gourds are sprawling plants that produce enormous quantities of fruit over the course of the season. The gourds they produce can be used to make drinking vessels, birdhouses, other decorative items. I don't think that they have a specific use, but they water bottle one of the sites I'm looking right. at is saying. Okay, yeah. so it's a it's a generic description of that kind of sh- general shape, shape where it's got a larger bowl at the bottom and yeah. a longer neck. Okay, so it could be made into different things depending on the exact shape. For sure, and, yeah. Okay. I'm going to read the Mayo Deer Dance Rattle Gourd while we're on the topic of gourds. Fruit shapes vary slightly from teardrop to short handle dipper used to make rattles for the deer dance. And this gourd 
uh, they look for all the world to me like pears. Yeah, they look like really beautiful pears. They're sort of a dusty greenish, like a grayish green. Yeah. And yeah, at least the ones featured here, I guess the description explicitly says the shape can vary, but these really look like the platonic form of a pear <laughs> in, in shape. Indeed. Hopi cassaba. Two distinct fruit types within this collection. One, wrinkled, round, yellow-green fruits. And two, smoothly elongated yellow-green fruits. Both have pale green to orange flesh. Juicy with a mild flavor. Tasty with chili, salt, and lime. Good keeper if unbruised. One thing that they don't give in this section as much as in the front end of this catalog is size. I've not generally been seeing descriptions of the size of the either the plant or the fruit as regularly. As I'm looking at these, the Hopi cassabas, I there's like nothing for scale and I truly do not know how big they are. Yeah, that's a fair point. I guess I'm not sure how big those are. But there's something I find really charming. I realize that standardized expectations are something that many people want out of many of their seeds. But I love that they've still got two distinct phenotypes uh-huh. yeah. in this particular yeah, it could look like either. population. And they're just letting you know that you should expect some of each or, you know, you should you should expect either and that either would be a a normal product of this seed. Yeah. Like you might get the wrinkled peas or the smooth peas. Yeah. (laughs) It'll be a surprise. Just a classic geneticist situation. Yeah. I'm going to read the Chapalote Pinole Maze, which is a popcorn corn, a stunning corn variety that was once grown from Southern Arizona to Sinaloa, Mexico. One of the four most ancient corns. God, I wonder what those other four most ancient corns are. A gorgeous deep brown ranging to a light tan color, small kerneled with slender ears. Plants are very tall and late maturing. Makes a sweet meal excellent for pinole. Can also be popped. The kernels of this corn in the picture look like like they're absolutely jewel-toned. They are such rich, amber, brownish. Yeah, and there's this again has a, a beautiful variety of jewel tones. Yeah. Where there's a garnet, a topaz, and I don't know, I mean it's a dark sapphire, I guess. Yeah. And the ears, each ear is one color. Right. The kernels are not mixed on an ear. Yeah, I don't know exactly what they mean by one of the oldest, one of Four the foremost corns. ancient yeah. corns. Corn was, you know, selected by humans from a wild grass right. called teosinte. And it looked like when I've seen pictures of corn before humans fucked with it, it looks like absolute shit. <laughs> well, like, it was a, it's a grass. It's a grass. I mean, it yeah. doesn't look anything like um, corn. So I don't, I guess I don't know the story of um, what corn's evolutionary corn. history yeah. to know like this is a deeply diverging corn lineage or whatever but yeah it's sure beautiful tarahumara chia a plant native from southeastern arizona to south america the cute flowers and foliage make it an attractive landscape plant unexpectedly lush for summer desert gardens gathered and used medicinally by the tarahumara Plant seed with the summer rains about one quarter inch deep. I would agree that the flowers are cute. Yeah. I mean, they're dainty. (laughs) I would say they're not dramatic flowers. Cute is a euphemism for small, maybe, in this context. Well, chia seeds are very small. Yeah, no doubt. Chia. 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 What are you what are you trying to do? Chia chia chia. What? You know. No. Chia 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 chia. No, I don't know. You get like they send you like a bust of I don't know, Reagan's head and then you grow chia out of, as his hair. Is that their song? Chia 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 chia, yeah. Oh. I mean, I'm familiar with the concept of a chia pet. I don't know that they have Reagan. 
but I, how could they not have Regan? There's a new pet. Chia. Chia pet, the pottery that grows. It's fun, easy, and educational. Just soak your chia overnight. Then spread the seeds like this. Keep it watered and watch it grow. Chia. Chia. It's educational. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> it said so. Yeah, got to take that seriously. I want to read the domesticated multi claw. Mm, great. Also known as the devil's claw. Devil's claws, the general. Term. General category. Yeah. Treasured by weavers, as many of the pods split into three or four claws instead of just two, claw length being around eight inches. So I guess it's used for the purpose of weaving. Yes. Very cool. I think it was while I was reading the website I encountered something about that particular variety of devil's claw as being one that they were pleased to have been, like pleased to have been able to find the seeds and begin growing it again. Yeah, I mean, it looks, it's very dramatic looking. You should look it up, dear listener. Okay, well, I'll link to this catalog. There are a million interesting uh, descriptions and beautiful pictures to look at. I I really recommend checking it out. All right, before we get out of here, I do have one piece of celebrity garden news Ooh. from earlier this week. It's from uh, Hello Magazine, noted paparazzi. The article's titled, Inside Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell's Never-Ending Garden at Family Home. Goldie Hawn and Kurt Russell have the most beautiful garden at their family home, and during the pandemic, the celebrity couple have been pictured inside their outside space, which is just a wild sentence to write. (laughs) The huge area has some quirky features, including a giant cow statue, which Goldie has even sat on for photo opportunities. There's also a meditating section complete with a Buddha statue where the First Wives Club star often sits near to reflect on her day. What's more, the famous couple's garden, and the next clause is bolded, is big enough for their grandchildren to run around in. (laughs) I mean, our garden is big enough for grandchildren to run around in. That's true of most yards. Yards, yeah. If if you are lucky enough to have a yard, then technically a child could run in a circle in it, generally. That's correct. I mean, I don't feel bad at all about making fun of this particular <laughs> piece of writing. There's a picture of Goldie Hawn on this huge statue of a cow, which I guess I can link to. And then sitting, meditating in her garden, there's a turtle statue and a Buddha statue in frame here. And there's really no information about the plants in their garden at all. Which makes me ask the following question to you. What statues should we have in our garden? Hot dog? Well, we do, dear listener, and really we should probably post a picture of this, have an indoor statue of a hot dog. (laughs) <laughs> that is one of our prized possessions. But I don't want to let that, I don't want to leave that out in the elements. It's too precious. No, I mean, I think we should have a different hot dog okay, statue. Okay, a second hot dog statue yeah. that's in the garden. Okay, well, that's a good viable idea, I think. My mother sent us a weird vase of a cat that I she think She listens would, to this. Well, it's a weird vase of a cat. It's a cat. It sits in the, like, the inside back porch in the window frame facing the garden and i mean not that we've had people over uh much in the last (laughs) year but in the past when we've had people over they've reliably thought it was our actual cat that was sitting in the window (laughs) well that's a best case scenario i think pink flamingo in the garden probably makes oh yeah for sure i would love to have a pink flamingo lawn ornament yeah But I do think that regardless of size and scope of garden, that I would be thrilled to have it be full of statues also. Yeah, I mean, that's always great. If anybody listens to this podcast, tell us what kind of statue you would like to or do maybe have in your gardens. Ooh, kinetic. What about kinetic sculptures in the garden? Wow. (laughs) Like what? Like, you know, like a thing that goes around. 
like with wind? Yeah. Mm. Or solar powered like in a some metal, way? Like a metal thing, like a metal whirly gig. You know, like that guy in Chapel Hill who makes all those... Whirly gigs. Whirly gig, all those metal kinetic sculptures yeah. that are all over Chapel Hill. I also think it would be funny in a... Burning Man? You could have Burning Man scale art <laughs> that takes up your whole yard. I really like the idea of having a modest garden like we do, but putting a full-size scarecrow in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be pretty funny. Hmm. But anyway, yeah, if any listeners have any ideas about this, let us know. Yeah, and if you have pictures of sculptures oh, in your yeah. garden, I'd love to see we'd that. Love to shit. see those too. We'll post a picture of our hot dog and the cat <laughs> that is in the window. And if you're so inclined, you can elect to follow us on Twitter at, at @cdbusiness or on Instagram at cdbusiness.com. You can email us at cdbusinesspod at gmail.com. If you'd like us to talk about a particular catalog, you can let us know. Send us any kind of pictures. That's fun. And assuming they have a Scoville unit rating that exceeds 50,000 units, should eat your vegetables. We're all just doing the best we can. Speak for yourself. It's CD Business. It's CD Business. Boring talk about seeds. CD talk between bores. Mind-numbing chatter about ovules and spores We'll dig a ditch and moan and split the difference It's CD Business It's CD Business